Otherwise, yeah, we'll, ne we'll never get going by waiting for nobody. So uh, I hope this recording works. A hit go. It's been a bit temperamental, but yeah, we'll see. Well, good morning. Thanks for turning up. <laughs> um, my name is Max. Uh, this is my colleague, Kyle. Um, uh, as you already know, we're um, both ex graduates. I graduated in 2012, and I guess Kyle five years after that. Um, and yeah, I think we both... Did you study this module when it at UWE? Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And who was running it when you did it? Uh, it was David Creasy. Creasy, yeah. yeah. So, so it died away not long after I left, and then it came back by through demand, basically. And then I think David Creasy left, and that's where we sort of started to get involved in sort of supporting it. Um, and yeah, just coming and doing a few lectures just to make that link back to, to uh, industry, really. And it's obviously quite nice that we're both UWE graduates as well. There is, there is hope, you know. So, um, but yeah, so start off with just a little bit about Mac. I like to keep it very casual, as I'm sure Kyle does as well. Um, any questions at any point, just just shout them out. You know, and I think you know we'll go off on a tangent. This, these slides alone aren't going to fill the whole hour and a half, so we either get an early lunch or you know if you want to go off on a tangent, talk about stuff, then please do by all means. So I think first of all, just a little bit about us as a company. So this is just a very brief overview of our history. We started out as Mac Acoustics. I think the you can see that based on Twitter, I still haven't let go of that. It's still got that there. Um, Acoustic Consultancy, supporting building contractors and architects and projects. Then we set up a testing company, so this was for us to get on site with contractors, test the building to understand what's, what's actually coming out of the ground, what people are building, test it, make sure it's compliance. Then we were struggling to naturally ventilate a lot of buildings on noisy sites, so whenever you open a hole in a building to let air in, it lets the noise in as well. So we developed a, a, an attenuator that we could sort of put on the facades of buildings, uh, ventilate, without, let, let the air in but not the noise. Then came Mac Energy, and this is where we really branched out from just doing things related to acoustics. This is where we started looking at building physics, so looking at overheating, daylighting, lots of different things. We then started getting very, we, there's a, an eternal obsession with automation at Mac Acoustics. Uh, and we sort of developed Mac Software, which was looking at a lot of architectural models. How do we get the information out of that? Um, how do we speed up what we're doing? You know, and then give the information back to architects in a much more accessible format. And then this was a bit of a, a curveball. We set up a separate residential thing where it was just an all in one sort of package that would mixing a bit of all of this together, but purely focused on residential projects. The good thing about a residential project is if you make one change to one wall, that's multiplied by a lot across all the different sort of flats and apartments or, or student accommodation rooms you've got. Uh, and yeah, and obviously yeah, I joined the picture in, in 2012. Uh, I guess you were 2017? Or, yeah, yeah, 2017. So yeah, before it really kicked off <laughs> with, with branching out. But then since 2020, this is my only PowerPoint. Uh, transition new big business not going to be death by PowerPoint don't worry and yeah since 2020 we've just been trading as Mac Group um, but yeah as I say still got Mac acoustics down on the footer so but I think that is the correct UWE um, logo I think I okay that so this is just a, an overview of uh, who is at Mac it's more of a who was at Mac now so obviously myself and Kyle in the middle but as I'm saying top left he's our founder sometimes he comes in the lectures very inspirational leader uh, Tracy the other partner of the business Andrew's now our MD a lot of people on the bottom are now gone. It's a very old slide, but it's just more to go through it. Um, there used to be a fair few UE graduates, um, but yeah, less so than, than they used to be. But yeah, Phil, top right, he's uh, probably our oldest UE, UE graduate, yeah, one of the originals. <coughs> so uh, just, just a brief interview, uh, introduction to you to understand who we are, basically. Uh, but now onto the meat of what we're going through today. Um, so obviously the module title, Architectural Acoustics, I'd imagine up until now you've pretty much been focused on the acoustics. Um, so this is obviously the other half of it, the architectural, how, how buildings are built fundamentally. And so we've got these four sections, construction techniques is just how, how does a building come about? And the second part is what does that mean for us from, a, from a, an acoustic consultancy point of view? How does sound move through the buildings? Regulations and standards, don't worry, it's a very brief section. I hear the excitement already for that one. Um, what we have to do, what we have to meet, and then how do we meet it? What products have we got out there that we can help us achieve those things? First of all, um, what is a building? Primary role of a building is to not collapse and withstand loads and create a dwelling or shelter for people to go into. I like this image just because it really messes with your head. Has anybody seen that before? Yeah. yeah. It's one of those things you think, is it Photoshop or is it not? But then you have to tree in front of it that's fine but it is i can assure you it is a real building it's built like that but the amount of effort that must have gone into to make that structure work is impressive but you know i just i just really like that 
a real example of where the structures really have to work hard to maintain that shape. And I contrast that very much oh, with this one, which is obviously an example of a, something that shouldn't look like that. It looks like it's had one too many on the way back from the pub. Um, but you know, this is an example of a, where the, the loading of the building has just exceeded its design limits. Very old building. Timber was the main construction, so wood can season over time. You know, can can walk. Um, and fundamentally, there's just less experience of building buildings. So, you know, you, you do see this a lot. Even the one on the left, you can see it's just slightly just sort of leaning off the bottom. You can see that the foundations are all solid. Nothing wrong with the bases of it. It is just the top floor. It's just that. Move. But it's still there. It's stopped moving. It's perfectly acceptable. And, you know, how many years old is that? Maybe four, five hundred years old? <coughs> a design life of a modern building is 60, 70 years. <laughs> so, you know, impressive. It hasn't fallen down yet. So this is just a, a, an image. I mean, I, whenever there's a lot of words on the slides, I tend to skim through it. You can read that in your, at your leisure. I like the pictures. Um, but th this is just to sort of effectively highlight how the loads are transmitted through a building. It all goes down to your foundations, really. I mean, it's just an example of there's lots of different types of foundations. Um, so what, what these arrows are showing is the direction the load is transforming. So obviously you'll get load for, on a floor for people in the building. That obviously then has to get transmitted to the walls supporting it, which is then gets tr transmitted down to foundation so obviously these connections are very important to ensure that everything's held together i think a few years ago i think somebody got confused with this and they seem to think that these were sound transmission paths but interestingly they sort of could be and you know we'll, we'll sort of come onto that as we move beyond the architecture onto the sound transmission a bit later <coughs> so this is an overview just of sort of the main the main pipes so on the top basically frame based buildings um, which is the most popular type of construction for most modern buildings which we'll go through a few examples load bearing masonry that's what most of you probably have in your um, experience in, in your homes and then there's prefabricated modular which is things that are built off site and carted to site which is becoming much more popular as time goes on so first of all example a concrete frame building so concrete columns concrete floor slabs and then this would get have lots of internal patches to put within it and then sort of walls put on the outside to seal the building up. Um, concrete is very, very strong under compression, but it's really weak under under tension. So they use reinforced concrete. Any ideas what it's reinforced with? Sorry? What's steel? Sorry, I didn't, didn't quite hear who he said there. Um, but yeah, so it's got it has steel columns inside the concrete columns. So it's kind of cheating really, isn't it? But you know, so whenever you see a concrete frame, it will have steel within it, but it's primarily concrete based building uh, and then steel frame is the other one this is one of the most popular um, I think because of how widely used it is um, it's quite cheap it's one of, one of the cheapest frames to make you know, steel it's very consistent in behavior so structural engineers like it they know how it's going to be whereas you compare that to a timber frame you know it's much more inconsistent it's at the mercy of the quality of the wood you, know, you sort of see rating on timbers for how strong they are and things like that in terms of the uh, impact noise, what is the uh, impact noise for black frame? That's a good question. Um, I mean, sort of when we, we'll get onto, I'll talk about stud partitioning um, early, uh, a little bit later on. But so, you, if you have sort of a, a C, like a metal stud wall and a timber stud wall, acoustically, in terms of sound insulation, the timber stud wall is a lot worse in terms of it, it transmits more sound through it. And that's just due to the sort of surface area and the rigidity of that timber. Whereas with a metal stud, it's sort of like a C shape a lot of the time. I don't know if you've seen sort of pictures. So you have it's fairly flexible, it's fairly lightweight. So any sound vibrating on one half of a like a, a plasterboard on one side of it doesn't get transmitted as readily through to the other half. So steel is always better. And when we get onto breaking the connections, it is all about it's yeah, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but yeah, we'll, we'll get onto covering sort of different ways we can deal with it. But yeah, adding mass and then breaking. Um, rigid connection between things is effectively the two two main processes so yeah another example of timber frame main difference for this you can see it's a much more dense frame which obviously says a lot about you know the strength of timber i mean timber is surprisingly strong it's just not as consistent so obviously there's a lot more factors of safety into, into the design of these things really so and then a load-bearing masonry so this i mean so the idea is that you can see the floor slab here and these brick walls are actually supporting that floor slab. All of the previous examples 
could have brick on the outside. So you can't tell from looking at. So what you could have is you could have like a, a brick facade here, and then sort of some windows. The key is that it's not structural. It's just there for decoration, finishing off weather protection. Um, whereas in this one, it is structural. If you take a bit of wall out, it's going to fall down. <coughs> Central Interesting. Maybe even And then there's prefabricated. So this is just one example. So this is again the process with this is it's basically made in a factory somewhere off site and then it's shipped to site. This particular example is cross laminated timber. Anyone heard of that before? I like to think of it as giant plywood basically is the easy way to describe it. So you sort of get them sort of anywhere from sort of sixty to hundred twenty mil thick to sort of these sorts of areas. It's just, yeah, giant plywood, basically, giant sheets. Um, it, it's fairly expensive in terms of its material cost compared to looking at a steel frame or a, or a concrete frame. But the benefit you have is you have much shorter build time on site. So, you know, you get it all cut and effectively it's like a Lego house. You just clip all the bits together and, you know, so it's time is money. So whilst the upfront cost of the material is more, quite often it neck and neck in terms of the overall cost and, is, is quite popular a lot. Obviously, timber timber um, products have got a lot of green credentials. Uh, it's also it's airtight as well, um, which for energy use is, is very popular. There's a there is a German standard called the Passive House standard, which um, it's got very very onerous targets to meet. It's far better than the UK building regs. Um, you know, just to put that into numbers, like, you know, I think you know, you'd have sort of half a meter thick insulation on the outside, air tightness like one tenth or less of what you get in on a, on a building regula regulations to buy a building in this country. Um, and what that means is, you know, let's say you have a £700 annual heating bill, there's only be £70 in a passive house because you are the heating source, just your own body heats, just doesn't really leave the, leave the house. But they're mechanically ventilated, so they don't overheat as well. So. <coughs> and this is just an example of, I think when I put this together, this was the tallest timber building in, in the world. Um, I think it. Yes, I think it, some of these numbers might not be 100% accurate. So don't quote me, but I think it was completed in 2015. I think it was 49 meters tall. Um, and then there's another one. The biggest one now is I think 84, 85 meters tall, which is also in Norway that was completed in 2019. Um, I think when when this one was around, there was another one in Vancouver, which was about five or six meters taller, but it had a concrete core, which is cheating, isn't it? So I, I never like to include that one as the tallest timber building because. So yeah, but it's just to show that it, it is quite versatile. It does have good, um, you know, structural strength that you can can go. I think there's a there's a Chinese or a Japanese forestry commission. I think I think they've said on there. I was only when I found out that this wasn't the tallest. I think there's I think that their 350th anniversary is in like 2041 or something like that, and they're going to build a 350 meter tall tower out of timber. So, <laughs> interesting to see if that ever comes to fruition or not. Certainly a lot of wood planning. Um, so yeah, those are just a few of the frame types and, and structure types. Um, and then what this is showing is that as things get taller and tall, thin walls fundamentally don't really work. As you can probably imagine, if you stand a bit of paper end on and push on it, it's not going to take a lot of load before it, it gives away. Whereas if you try to put a bit of card, you might have a bit more luck. So sort of gradually work your way out. So thicker walls um, can support better loads. Um, it, and ultimately, it's just showing the house of excess load. Bowls, that sort of my, my card paper analogy is basically like this. So, as I touched on earlier, sort of these these connections are absolutely key to make sure that things are things are going to stay together and not move apart. One of the most common approaches to get around these sort of the tall thin issue is cavity walls, which I'm sure you most of you are familiar with. Does this drawing make sense to everybody? Or so sort of these are outside the building, so we've got brick and concrete blocks. And we're going to wall tie tie them together, and that's the key for the structure. Um, that's basically so the two two leaves. So each half is called a leaf. So the two leaves of, of brick and block work are effectively holding each other together. So if one tries to lean, the other one effectively holds it in place, and it allows you to go much taller. And then this would just be a layer of plasterboard internally, which is the the room, and this will be the insulation for several reasons more than anything else. Could have an acoustic benefit depending on what, what's going on with that wall tie, something we'll cover um, a little bit later. So I'll just take a seat.
as you can hear, I'm recovering from a bit of a cold, so I, I might start running out of steam soon, but Kyle, Kyle will be taking over for the second half, so I haven't got too much longer to go. So, so that's that. Everybody happy with everything so far? Yeah. <laughs> so we've looked at the main walls, the main frame, construction. <coughs> and internally, we've got a bit more freedom in what we're doing, so a lot of these walls are not structural, they're just a partition off um, different parts of the building. So this is an example of building shelves being constructed <coughs> and all of these internal leads. So these are mount the studs that have been set up. So we've got this sort of base track. You know, have a head track at the top. And what would happen is come along and put plasterboard on all of these. And as you can see, a door is going to go in here. And that's effectively how buildings are partitioned up. That's plasterboard. You'll find yourself knocking things here. That's a lightweight plasterboard wall. Um, So it's probably, probably a steel stud in this building. So then internal floors. Um, typically, it'll be a concrete floor or a, or a timber floor. So this is an example of a timber floor. So exactly as what you'd expect with a, with a, with a wall. It's got a series of uh, joists. So when, it, when it's vertical in a wall, you tend to call it a, a timber stud. So it's like this, you call it a timber, timber joist. So obviously, these are um, bolted to the wall. Transmitting load here, supported by this little door fall underneath it. And obviously, a door covering would go over the top of that. These are the most lightweight, so naturally they can vibrate and transmit sound the most. Um, so if, if ever you have a project that has something like this on, it's going to give you the most problems. Uh, very common in uh, within uh, residential dwellings. Not so common in other buildings. It's more so in older buildings. But then across sort of bigger buildings, sort of healthcare buildings, educational buildings, large res residential you have concrete floors typically. So this is a precast concrete floor. So again, similar to the prefabricated uh, wall, wall panels, they, these are made off-site. Truck brings them to site, door crane them to place. So obviously they have to sit on a, a steel frame. It could be a concrete frame equally as well. Um, the hollow points are just there to uh, reduce the weight of them, but obviously it does reduce, reduce the weight. It's great for logistics, getting them to site, but not great for acoustics. Um, so these are all placed down, and then what, what happens is then a wet concrete mix is poured on top of this to effectively do and set it all, all together. Um, so it's much heavier than a timber floor, so it's not too bad acoustically, but not as good as this final option. So this is a poured in situ concrete floor. So what you have is you have a profiled metal deck. So this is laid across, uh, it's like a, like a crinkly tin roof basically that's laid across your steel structure, and then wet concrete is poured into this. Um, and so, so you can see there's obviously working on here and at the top of the image you can see that they're sort of flying out the top of the slab. Um, because it's wet, full concrete, it's much more dense than the precast um, planks that have, have the holes in them. So this is sort of the best in terms of sound insulation performance you get out of the floor typically and then obviously how, how well that is all comes down to the thickness of the concrete that's poured on top. Trying to get away with the least concrete as possible is always the goal. The more concrete you need, the more structure you need, the more structure you need, the more space you need, everything just costs um, extrapolate. Equally, if you put lots of ventilation equipment on the roof, you'll need more structure for that. You know, so there's lots of things. Build, obviously, building tractors are trying to always build a building to the, to the cheapest price, you know, always, you know, so it's always making sure that it just to say works. Obviously, if you get something wrong in acoustics, it's gonna be very different than if you get it wrong in structures, so. It was a school I worked on a number of years ago and they had a steel frame up and uh, they brought one of the, a few of the precast concrete planks, dropped one onto it and then the whole steel frame just bent over. And yeah, that's somebody somebody got fired. But yeah. Whereas, you know, we if we don't put enough treatment in, it's much less 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 risky. So as we come below the floor slab, um, <coughs> suspended ceiling, so you never know what room I'm gonna be in when I'm talking about this, but Look above, there's a perfect example. So this is a, a suspended metal, metal grid, and then you've got these mineral fiber tiles just laid into it. So these are these pr can provide two, two, op two benefits acoustically. So that these can be acoustically absorptive. So the, these will be a, a mineral fiber. So any sound hitting those will be mostly getting uh, absorbed. Have you done absorption classes, porous absorbers? So that's exactly how a ceiling tile is working. But it's also working as a bit of a panel absorber as well, because you've got the void above it as well. So you get pretty good absorption depending on the void. Um, 
and it will also be improving the sound insulation. So let's say this is a concrete slab, any any sound that's coming through from above, it's obviously going to travel through this void, and then it'll be limited as to how much um, goes through the ceiling as well. So they, they have a benefit of improving sound insulation in the space, and also uh, reducing reverberation within the space as well. That's only if it is a full grid like this, where it's covering the entire room. The alternative approach for sort of room acoustic treatment and ceilings is sort of like free hanging treatment. So these are placing these at various trendy cafes and things like that. Um, ultimately, it's free hanging acoustic absorber. This isn't going to give us any sound insulation uh, benefit simply because the sound is just going to come through all the gaps. And acoustics are only ever as strong as your weakest link. It doesn't matter how good your wall is. If you've got a massive hole in it, that's where the sound's coming through. How come like, it doesn't look like What do you mean, sorry? Like, in a lot of control rooms, they have, like, free hanging ceilings. Um, although, like, it's the least insulated. Yeah, I mean, if it's, I mean, in a control room, I guess most of what you're trying to do in a control room is you're trying to kill off the re response and reflections from the room. So, I mean, I, I don't know what specific example you're thinking about, but, I mean, obviously, the, if you had this for sound insulation, it's not going to stop sound going out of your space or equally coming into it. Um, that would you only get better from that if you're covering the whole space. Obviously, in a control room, if you had a, you could have a suspended ceiling like this, but then above it, you'd probably have a big bit of foam like that, so that you're absorbing frequencies across a huge range. I mean, it's much more specialist space control room where you are looking for, um, you know, a, a dead space across most of the frequency range. Whereas a lot of buildings, we, you know, most buildings, I mean, have we worked on any music studios? Um, Not many. No. It's you know. So most of what we're doing is just talking about boring, normal buildings ultimately. And yeah. uh, and you know, even when I talk to my mum about it, you know, you say, "Oh, I'm producing some. Oh, like concert halls? Mm. <laughs> Not really." And in a in a way, buildings like control rooms, concert halls are easier for acoustics because everybody knows the acoustics are important, so you get a lot more respect. But when you're talking to someone about the acoustics on a the school, they just it's an invisible problem. You know, they if it were, you know, you only, you only notice if it goes wrong. So yeah, going back to your control room, I mean, I, it, I mean, you, you can get things like this that are acoustically reflective as well. So it might be to reinforce a reflection from the speakers, or not, not that you'd normally want to do that in a control room, but obviously right. you can do what you like in a, in a control room. But. So yeah, when they're suspended uh, horizontally, we tend to refer to them as rafts, and when they're suspended vertically, we tend to refer to them as baffles. They're fundamentally the same material. They tend to be 40, 50 mil thick, and it's just compressed mineral fiber which is basically like loft insulation, which is exactly the same buildup of a, of, a, of a ceiling tile, really. So that's an, a very brief crash course in what buildings are, how, how they've come together. And so now this is sort of tying it back to the acoustics and, and why, why this is all important for us. And it's all about sound transmission through the structure. But the structure is inherently rigid. If it's not, not a structure, it's just a pile of building materials. So these are just a few, again, this is a wordy slide, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but these are just a few examples of how sound can transmit into a building structure. So the top one is singing produces sound pressure variations in the air, which I'm not singing right now, but I'm talking, it's the same process. Uh, reach the surface and cause it to vibrate. So obviously the, the, key, the key surface that my voice is vibrating is your eardrum, so you can actually hear me. But it will also be going to all the side walls, and some of that will be being transmitted through the walls. How much we need to stop it obviously depends on what it is. Um, but I, I, I really like this image. I think it pictures a thousand words. So what we've got here is I have a sound source in a room. I've got some rooms around it. And obviously we have the direct sound, which is the most easy to understand. You know, if I shout at that wall, some of, a lot of my vocal energy is going to hit that wall and it's going to go through it. But then it's the flanking paths, which as you can see are pretty numerous, and obviously this is just a, an illustration there, there's far, far more than this, but you can see that some of it will go into the floor, I was going to say. Well, the good thing about this is that it doesn't actually say if, that's a, if this is a side cut through or a top cut, so this, but the key is that it works both ways. So if this is a floor or a side wall, depending on how you interpreted it, some of it goes into here, and then some can go up and out of here, re-radiate into this room from everywhere. You, this is quite prolific in a concrete frame because everything is continuous. Um, however, because the concrete frame is so heavy, it does minimize how much actually goes through. But in terms of like uh, flanking, I mean like for timber and stuff, like how um, how crucial it is like, compared to like regular impact noise. 
Uh, well, I mean, it's, the, re the regulation standards, what you need to do is, is almost always going to be the same depending on the building type. Um, so you're always going to want a particular reduction in sound across a wall, floor, whatever it is. And, and well, fundamentally, acoustic sound doesn't care what it's made of, yeah. but what it's made of affects just what you have to do. So yeah. if you have a concrete floor, it's going to do a lot of the work for you, and then you just might need to add a, a fairly nominal ceiling underneath it to finish off. If you've got a timber floor, you'd be looking at you know insulation, a fairly hefty ceiling underneath it, some resilient connections, which we'll, we'll cover on a bit later. So it's just you get less. You, you're starting from a much lower point with the timber floor because you've just got much less mass. My question is like flanking noise is not as significant as the direct noise. Um, that's a good. It depends. There's a few examples. I mean, if you depends if you dealt with it or not. Ultimately, I mean, it all it all. Have you you covered RWs and DWs? No. Okay. I'm not sure what the call it. I used to do a lot more, of course. So I used to have a better handle on what you guys were covering. I'm not, not as aware now. But an RW, I won't go into specifically because if you haven't done it, you probably don't need to do it. Um, but it's absolutely key for us. So an RW is a sort of a, and the R is a a sound reduction, so it's a rating for how much a material reduces sound as it goes through it. But the DW, the W is just weighting it, so it's a single number, so don't worry about those. But the D is a level difference. So, for example, if you have 100 dB in here, you have a wall that reduces by 40. What noise level are you going to have in here? 60. It's going to be more than 60. Because that you'll get 60 just from through the wall. You'll be 60 plus all of these. Uh, it could be 60 if you've dealt with all of those. But the D, the level difference between the two rooms, is how most standards define what you need to achieve because that's what's important for the end user. You don't care what the actual wall is. You want to know it has sound. Even if there's 100 dB in this room, it can't exceed 60 in here. That's my requirement. I want a reduction of 40, so you have a D. So what you find is this wall probably you put it in as a 50, um, just very crudely speaking, so that then once you add the sort of 50 you've got from here, plus all the other little bits in here, it doesn't exceed the 60. I'm just making these numbers up. Um, but it's, so it's the sum of all of them. So whether the flanking is or isn't important, it, it, it's a factor, okay, so. basically. If you dealt with it, then, then you almost you give it the illusion that it's not important, but ultimately if you ignore it, and there's, we've got some good graphs, which we'll, I think Kyle will cover a few of them later, where we look at the difference in direct and flanking and Definitely putting putting some numbers against them. <clears throat> what about the, the coincidence effect? Like in that situation, like, is it something that you guys take into consideration when trying to insulate? Was well, then the, the coincidence frequency? Yeah. Uh, on a day to day basis, we probably wouldn't. I mean, ultimately, the the targets you get are simplified. So when I said a DW, that W is a basically there's a there's a British standard that weights. All of your level differences at different third octave bands weights them into a single figure. So you have acoustics is so complicated. Everything we're dealing with is information reduction, um, which is a problem in itself because you're simplifying and then you're simplifying a simplification just to make it manageable and so you can actually compare things. Um, so we would only ever ever get um, a target. It's just a single number ultimately. So we would be looking at all the individual ones. So. If you had a coincidence dip at certain points and where you can see it's not performing very well, you wouldn't necessarily even look at it if it's just a classroom or a fairly standard space. If you're designing a recording studio, you probably would look at it. I mean, but generally with a recording studio, you're looking at such hefty constructions, you, you tend to it tends to take care of itself. If, as long as you've got space to deal with your problems and you can put in big walls, then you can deal with a lot of things. But a lot of the time is you're trying to get it into the architect's giving you 150 mil to sort their problems out with your magical acoustic dust. <laughs> and you're like, well, I just can't do it. And smaller voids, you, you get much worse resonant frequencies that then do tend to, you know, you have boominess coming through and things like that. Um, so, yeah, on, on an av average day, we definitely wouldn't account for it. Um, but, you know, I think whenever you, tri like triple glazed systems as well, that like you try to never have the two voids the same, so the resonance in both the camera, I mean, that's not strictly coincidence, well I guess that's from the thickness of the glass, you have the same coincidence, so you'd want to have different thickness panes as opposed to having two 10 mil panes that have both the same coincidence dip, you will have a big problem at that particular frequency, so glazing systems I guess it's used a little bit in, so you might have a 6 mil glass and a 10 mil glass, right. not because you need the extra sound insulation of the heavier 10 mil, but just so that they're not weak at exactly the same frequency, ultimately. Oh, yeah, I was talking about glazing, yeah, so there we have. Yeah, so 
possible route to try and triple glaze and can reduce airborne noise from that side. Okay. These are just flanking examples of where. So yeah, triple glazing, an example there. I mean, triple glazing can be worse at low frequency, funnily enough, just because of the, the, the double cavities. Um, but yeah, so that you could use that to reduce overall noise level. But then if you've got rumble coming through the floor, that's something you need to deal with as well. Um, and I quite like this video because um, this effectively um, highlights the significance of direct and direct and sound. So if you've got a music box here, this is the table. Music box is going to be placed on the table, and then we're going to look at covering it to, to kill off the direct path, and then we're going to look at putting it on a base to kill off the flanking sound. And it's a few different scenarios, and it's just, yeah, illustrates what, what, what I'm basically explaining. Yeah, right, so flanking path that's coming out underneath it and the direct sound as well so i think that hopefully that video is useful just to highlight those, those earlier images and what i was trying to explain um obviously a lot of the time we're not trying to just contain tiny music boxes so it's not that simple so yeah this is the sort of the image i said a graph it's not a graph it's just a table um but this is what put together just to highlight the significance of of flanking sound so this is just a, a cut through so we've got a floor slab Top and below, are just a generic wall. We have direct sound, and we'll have we have a flanking path through the floor slab uh, and below, and, and the same at the top. And what we've got here, so the two terms I used earlier, so we've got up a part to partition RW. So this is the rating of how well the wall here is, is stopping sound, and we've effectively changed that for each of these options, going from 50 up to 65. And then what we've done is we've looked at how that is actually affecting the room to room transmission between these two. I mean, these are just a generic fairly thin concrete slab just uh, in some modeling software we have just to, to highlight the point. But for a 50 RW wall, all in all, you're getting a, an on-site level difference DW of 45 dB. So not as good as what your partition is because you have the sun. It's because that data level difference, the bigger that goes, the better. Can you explain? I didn't really understand like what is the RW represented and what is the DW represented? Sorry, the, the RW is that is the performance of this wall only. So that, that is how, so an RW is a figure measured in the laboratory. So they would take this wall, put it into lab conditions, and they're only just met where all of the flanking paths are isolated. And they just measure transmission through the elements. And this is in dB? Yes, they, these are all in dB, yeah. Okay. Except the percentages, of course. So these are fairly high performing partitions. So this would be a fairly standard plasterboard wall. 50 RW you can get out of most uh, double plasterboard each side. 70 mil C stud, and then as you get here, so 65, that's that sort of twin independent studs where you're breaking apart the wall. Um, this is sort of more around what you can find around music spaces, but even higher than that. So that is that's just the rating of the partition changing. Nothing else is changing, but the floor slab stays consistent. And what this is trying to show is, so with the 50, you get an on-site level difference. So if you have 100 dB in here, you'd have 55 in here, because you're only using 45 of it. And that 45 loss is a combination of what the wall's stopping and what the floor slabs are stopping. If you increase the wall performance to 55, so a 5 dB increase on the wall, you get a 2 dB increase on the on-site level difference. And then you can start to see you get diminishing returns. Uh, and that's what this one is trying to do, is looking at the percentage of how much is coming through direct sound and how much is flanking sound. So the solid line is direct, the dotted line is flanking. So you can see the first example, you've got a pretty 50-50 split, you know, so which is a perfectly balanced, and you, you say that's quite well designed, you know, there's <coughs> not over-designed slab, you're not over-designed the wall, it's pretty much not that you'd be aiming to do that, but sometimes you have to value engineer a lot and try to thin things as much as possible just to scrape it through. Um, and as you can see, as we increase the wall, you know, particularly in this example, you know, only 8% of the total contribution is coming through that wall, but 92% is... But it's not the same level, is it? Like it's 92% of flanking sounds, but the sound is reduced, isn't it? Uh, well, it, between these two, it's not. So what we're measuring here, we're not measuring a sound level. This is a sound a le a level difference. So whatever you put in here, it will be minus that in here, in this side. 
So right. if it's like going through, if it's like passing, so if it started, let's say like uh, 54% uh, through flanking and 46% uh, direct, like uh, direct path, when it's like converted into more flanking, like 92%, it, it's not the same level, is it? Uh, well, it will be, yeah. It will be so the flanking contribution will be the same on all of them. So overall, like it doesn't matter if it's flanking or direct. No, it, it doesn't matter. You just got to deal with both ultimately. I mean, what this is doing is highlighting that you can you can go as crazy as you like on your wall, unless you deal with this weak flanking path. It's not helping you at all, basically, and that's what this is showing. You can see at the earlier stage where it's a bit more balanced, you do get a slight increase. And what we'll do, I think, I think we just want to cut off section plates and look at adding in some floors and seams and seeing how we can really start to boost these up and not not be limited so much on the flanking. And the main aim of this is just to highlight the significance of flanking and you can't just put a bigger wall in to deal with it. You have to deal with your flanking problems. So structural rigidity and sound. So more points I think I've covered mostly. Annoying sounds mainly, squeaky floorboards, windows rattling. I'm sure most people have houses that have experienced those. Um, but yeah, the two, the two key words in here is resilient material, so anything that resists sound passing through it, and decoupling, if you can just separate them somehow, even better. Um, so resilient is your, is your you know, decoupling would be your, your, your nuclear option. That's, you know, if something's not connected, then it's just airborne. There's no structural transmission. And then a resilient connection is just reduced um connection so that's it for me i'll hand you over to kyle um yeah a, a nice intro of regulations and standards from kyle great so i'll get the little dry section there uh so regulation standards why do we have regulation standards you know, why do we have regulations in houses just to ensure like the, the lowest level of acceptable quality yeah, so what would the qualities be? What, what, what do you want to achieve? Some sort of energy efficiency and blood flow soundness. So in terms of noise, what kind of issues? Were... Outside noise. Exactly. So one is outside noise getting in into the building. So yeah, between rooms and the last one. Anybody. Sorry? Transmitting out. Transmitting out. It's less so, that's kind of... Uh, included in the sound installation bit. The last one is room acoustics. So in the residential buildings, it's not as uh, not particularly important, but in less in schools. So in less in this room, room acoustics is important, right? Because if it's too reverberant, then and, uh, I know you've been studying about uh, speech transmission index. Mm -hmm. So if it's too reverberant, then you wouldn't be able to hear me because the speech transition transmission index is uh, lower. So you got the three three uh, areas, internal, internal ambient noise levels, so that's like noise level in the room, and that might consist of traffic noise inside the room. Uh, and then sound in station, that's you know between spaces, and you got the room acoustics. And <clears throat> so the building regulations uh, was set up, uh, I think it was in the 1800s, is that right, Max? 1600s. 1600s, yeah. oh yeah, well, a long time ago. First first official big building regulations was after the Great Fire of London, when they probably thought we should probably regulate what people are doing after such a big fire. And it, obviously it's not enforced anymore, but the two, there's just two regulations, I think. One was that you couldn't have your top floor jacking out more than your bottom floor, so you, your buildings can't be touching, and you have to build your houses out of every fence, so they don't burn like crazy, basically. So a fairly sensible start, but that was back to historical origins of, of building regulations. But yeah, I think these approved documents came in in 1984. Um, the party 2003, which is the one that we're in. So you can see that they gradually worked their way to, through the parts. Um, you know, obviously you can see what the structure, obviously that, that's top. Without that, you don't have a building. Fire safety, yeah, great fire London again. And then you can see, and one, one that always surprised me is that ventilation is lower than resistance to the passage of sound. But I think my theory for that is old buildings are leaky. You don't need to ventilate them, they ventilate themselves. So. As only as we start building things better, sealing them off, we need to actually constantly think about it. Yeah, great. Uh, so, yeah, so we've got all of those, and then we've got the party, which is relevant to acoustics. And in, in our job, uh, when we're designing residential buildings, we 
the, the achieve the criteria set in Part E. Um, and I'll just go through that. There, there's actually this Part O now as well, which is about energy efficiency and noise as well. So it, it's much more moving towards conservation of energy. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think. So we've got four main criteria uh, that the building regs provide. So the first one is uh, the external partition. So that is, so if you have two dwellings next to each other, so terraced houses, you have to make sure that the separating wall between the two terraced houses is you know, sufficiently beefy, so that the sound insulation performance between it is good, and you don't, you're not hearing your neighbour cough essentially. Um, then you've got the internal uh, walls within a dwelling, so that's you know between two bedrooms. You don't want to hear you know the person in the other bedroom. Um, and then you've got the reverberation in common uh, internal parts. So let's say if you have an apartment block and you have a, a shared corridor, so you want to reduce the noise buildup in there because essentially in a, in a corridor, you don't have control over what is taking place in there because it might be your neighbor that's walking through and making a lot of noise. So if it's really reverberant in the shared corridor, then you can, so the noise builds up and then that built up noise will get through the door and you'll be able to hear it. So you want to reduce that noise buildup. So it's uh, the impact is minimized. And E4, that's the last one, and that is basically schools. You want to make sure that the, the environment, acoustic environment in school is sufficient. Uh, yeah. Um, I lived in a basement flat and the upstairs neighbor is like, you know, my, my ceiling is not that high, it's like 225. Yeah, and like basically, I can hear everything it does, like you know, impact noise, like, yeah. you know, like a motherfucker and just like walking around, I hear him cough, like he opens a drawer, I hear it. So, in terms of like noise regulations, like is there something I can do about it? Um, not sure about the old houses. So, the party this came about was it two thousand three? Um, so it's pretty recent uh, in the grand scale of things. So if a house uh, or the apartment was built or converted before that, then the regulation wasn't enforced. So they basically got away with it. And unless they go through another refurbishment, then they don't technically have to uh, update it. Uh, unless, I think you can complain, and uh, they might do something, but it's probably unlikely, uh, is, right. is my thought. So if they like, if, if they refurbished it after, it came, like after 2003, yeah. so is it is there the ground for like, you know? Yeah, if they, yeah, if they, let's say if they had a house and they split it into like multiple flats. I think that's what happened. Yeah, if it's post 2003, then they would have had to do it. Um, so maybe yeah, you find it. Yeah, it's like a separate dwelling above you. Like, um, yeah. yeah, it's like a, a different like flat, basically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. How, how did we get around it? And what I'm going to lot of student accommodation, unfortunately, guys. Um, is you sort of treat it as like what's called a cluster flat, where you're treating the whole building as, as one dwelling with lots of bedrooms. Mm. So then you, then it goes on to e, your E2 requirement for an internal wall, which is ridiculously low and there's nothing. Obviously, it's only for walls, and it's for walls and floors, but there's no impact requirements right, right. for it. So people will try to do that as much as possible because it's a lot cheaper. And mm -hmm. um, even regs are not great. You know, if you've got some of those regs compliant, it's not the best building in the world. It's just it's a basic provision, uh, and the impact one in particular is widely known that it doesn't cover the low enough frequencies that really disturb. It's one of those widely known things, but anything in the industry takes about twenty five years to change. Wow. So don't hold your breath for it to change anytime soon, unfortunately. But it's widely known. But there are lots of standards out there, like voluntary standards, unfortunately, like Green, where you look for betterments above building regs. So you might go for plus five or plus eight above UV requirements and. Those are much better. So, right. is yeah. there a way like to know if it's considered as like one unit of like well, like one dwelling or basically separated dwelling? So, the so landlord like, should know, yeah. in theory. But I mean, if, if, if do you have shared entrance access, yeah, yeah. So that that might mean it's not considered separate. So if you all have you have a communal corridor. Although you oh, should... to be fair, like, I do have, like, my own, because it's a basement flat, so I do have, like, you know, a separate corridor that leads to, like, it's the same corridor, but then I take a right, and then everybody goes to the building. Do you, do you share the same front door? No. Okay. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. it should be considered separate. I mean, the best thing you could do is first of all raise it to landlord, mm-hmm. and then you can go to the council and put a complaint, and then environmental health can look at it. They may instruct a sound test to be done across the check that it's compliant. Fortunately for you, you'll probably find out it is compliant, <laughs> and it's just rubbish standards, unfortunately. But, right. Yeah. Um, well, that's the approach you take. I mean, there's a disincentive for the landlord in that if you complain to the council, I think it gets logged. And if you try to sell the house later on, the, the log is there. So it stops them, not doesn't stop them. But, it, you know, you don't want to buy a house where you have you already have a complaint about sand installation, right? Yeah. So it might make it more difficult for the landlord. So I think we can say that. Decide how much you like your landlord. But... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I've been called by uh, a council saying at one of our you know council buildings um the tenant is complaining that she can hear the cat upstairs walk and went and tested it and it's you know atrocious sound insulation performance and you know it's probably she probably could hear the cat walk um so i think and that was because it was an old building so it was pre pre this you know regulation being enforced so yeah it's a difficult one they, they had no mandatory requirement to update it but i think they were anyway because it's so old and so, yeah. So like, what is like it? you measured it and you, you were like, okay, yeah, it's really bad. Like, what did they do with it, basically? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they did. Um, I mean, the, the the job was to just go test it and yeah. let them know how bad it is. Um, and it was quite bad. How did you test it? Um, if you come to the practical later, you find out. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, the tapping machine? Yeah, tapping machine. It got sound, uh, sound insulation through walls, floors, essentially. So airborne and impact will cover. Uh, so BB93, so that, so that's, this is the fourth bit of the building regulations. Uh, BB93 is... So, sorry, Cal. Yeah. Dr. Kirby, but just before we move on from, if you, if you go back to the building regs, I always find it surprising there's four building regulations for acoustic. That's it. Three of them to do with residential buildings that have got multiple dwellings in it. And the fourth one is just to do with schools. That's it. I always find that amazing that that's all that's actually regulated, you know, to office design, healthcare, it's all voluntary. You know. It's crazy. Yeah. I'm starting to find that out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, BB93, this is the standard uh, that's around uh, to help us design um, the schools in terms of acoustics. And it covers the three main areas that we talked about earlier. So in, indoor ambient noise levels, so that's in, noise inside the room when it's not occupied. So that consists of like traffic noise breaking into the room and sometimes building services noise if it's like mechanically ventilated or if you have like a air conditioning inside the room. So the sound insulation between rooms, so that's, you know, we already covered. You don't want to hear the classroom next door because you'll be you know, distracted. And then you've got the room acoustics. So you can, the speech intelligibility is reasonable and you can hear what the teacher is saying. Um, And you've got the HTM. So this is about the healthcare and it basically covers the three points as well. But uh, the the one main difference is that it has a privacy requirement. So, So if you're in a consultation room and you're talking about your, you know, physical problems, you don't want the person in the next, you know, the next room to be listening to your, you know, personal problems. So there's a privacy requirement. So, in a, let's say in a school, you don't really care about noise from a classroom going into a storeroom because there's no one in the storeroom to annoy. But in a healthcare building, you do care about that because you don't want someone in the storeroom listening into your private health conversations. Uh, yeah, and then we got the BS eighty three three. So this is a bit of an all rounder uh, standard or, or guidance, and um, so it's mainly used for offices, but you can use it for multitude of building uh, types. You, know, you can use it for leisure centres, you can use it for police offices, you name it. Uh, everything apart from healthcare, residential, and schools, you can basically use this for because it's it's not tailored for anything. Need a specific, and again, this covers uh, sound insulation um, and internal ambient noise levels and reverberation, although to a less lesser extent for reverberation. So this one doesn't provide specific like numbers to achieve for reverberation, and it basically asks the person using the document to specify a suitable target. 
And we might do that from previous experience, or we might refer to BB93, the school. So the BB93 standard is considered to be, you know, the most comprehensive uh, design guidance we can use. So it's, it's got a lot of information, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, out of all of those, I would say if you just look at one, I, I recommend BB93. It's specific for schools, but it's the most comprehensive in, in that it makes, it's got an accompanying design guide with it. It's freely available on, on the .gov website. I think it's, it's just the most acceptable thing. It's certainly better than any British standard. You can just read it and get it. You know, anybody who wants to better their knowledge, which is it's absolutely a great place to start. It's one of the documents I started reading when I first joined Mac. So yeah. Yeah. And if you go through a little bit in the practice as well. Yeah. And if you're doing the uh, assessment about sound speech transmission index, then there's data for that in, in that document. So you might I don't know if you're already referring to it or not. Uh, maybe the criteria that. Uh, Zach has like given to you that that might have already come from BB ninety three. Have you heard of any of these standards before? Or? No. no. <clears throat> yeah, it's probably been extracted already. Yeah. Uh, so that was regulation and standards. Uh, and now now we touch on the solutions and products to achieve the criteria that we talked about before. So it's all in the details. And what I, what I mean by that is uh, so detail is where two elements kind of intersect so let's say where that wall and this wall intersects or the floor and that wall intersects or the floor and the roof intersects so that is usually where flanking is most prominent um, so you know uh, in the slide that max showed earlier you can see that you know no matter how much you beef up the wall you might if the flanking contribution <laughs> is significant then that is going to be a weakest point and, and no matter how you know it's, you're not going to get an overall betterment uh, of your significant betterment, no matter how much you increase the performance of the wall. Um, and the main two main techniques to improve the overall performance is to add mass. So if it's a wall, uh, let's say you have one layer of plasterboard, one layer of plasterboard, and you have a stud connecting the two, then that is not particularly, you know, particularly good because the mass is quite low because you only have one layer of reach. So if you want to add mass, then you want to add two layers, you know, a layer of plus or another layer of plus or on each side, and that would, you know, you're doubling the mass, and you should get a, a pretty significant improvement there. And then you've got the decoupling. Um, on a wall, is you can decouple by having a two separate stud. So, so you know, uh, if you have plus board, plus board, and two separate studs there, and if you're in this room making noise, then you're the sound is hitting this plasterboard, vibrating, and then it's trying to vibrate through the stud, but it's not hitting, it's not attached to the other stud, so you're know, decoupling. So you get uh, sound insulation improvement through that. So controlling flanking, um, you got uh, quite a few different ways of uh, dealing with it. So in this example, we've got the, the intersection between a wall and a floor. And we've got, you know, the crosses and ticks. And this is kind of our standard uh, recommendations on what not to do and what to do. Um, can someone guess why that is not particularly good in terms of flanking? As long as you know what you're looking at. Uh, yeah, yes. so, so that's the wall. So this is called a layer of screed. So screed is uh, a light density concrete that you pour over. Uh, and that's basically to have to have a smooth floor finish. And, and that layer there in the middle, that's insulation. And then this is, uh, let's say, a concrete uh, plank, a big thick concrete plank. So if you made noise in that room, why would this detail mean that there's noise going through and flanking over to the other room? Because you're taking a direct contact. Yeah, but then are you not in direct contact with that one? It's not decoupled from the board, so the transmission is obviously there. Um, so in comparison to that, so what do you mean? Which bit is decoupled? Can you elaborate? The other parts are more decoupled because they, their point of contact or flank is your more thick layer below. Yeah. While yeah. the one on the left is the more vibrating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so for that one, you've got noise generated in there, and you obviously have a direct sound path. But 
if you make noise in there, then you're going to resonate that, that layer there. And because that layer is continuous between rooms, the sound can flag through that uh, into the other room. While for the ones with the ticks, you have the wall breaking the screed and insulation. So rigid materials are good for uh, you know, transmitting noise. So, so the, uh, the screed is good, good at transmitting noise, uh, but insulation in the middle, not as much. Um, so you've, you've broken the screed and the insulation there. And that one is also okay because you've broken the screed with uh, that little cross in the middle. So that is a timber stud uh, that you can just lay down to break, break up the connection. Um, and then you've got something similar here but with a raised axis floor. Uh, so why do we have raised axis floor? And yes. What benefits are there at having race access rules? Or which buildings will you uh, do you commonly find race access rules in? It'd be like mostly offices, and that's because you can run services underneath. So you might have, you know, if you go to an office building, then you can have like plugs popping out from like anywhere in the floor. And it's because if you have a really, you know, really big open plan office, then you still need like access to power from like, within the within the room, the middle bits of the room. So that's handy. Sometimes you kind of have hanging power supplies. Um, so that there's that. But also sound insulation. If you add another layer, then uh, you often get betterment there. You obviously have to deal with the, the resonance in the cavity, uh, and that's why you've got the mineral insulation in these areas here. Uh, so that's good. Um, it doesn't do anything for room acoustics. So it's mo mo mostly sound insulation. Um, and then obviously you've got, so this one has got a big cross and that's because if you have a continuous void underneath the wall, then you've got noise you know, going through the floorboard underneath and into the void and goes through and comes back out. So that's obviously not a good flanking design, so you've got a big flanking part there. And to avoid that, you've got the wall built through the raised access floor, and that basically cuts off the, the void underneath the raised access floor. Uh, so that's why that works. Well, on the top of the images, does anyone know why the insulation is there in the first place? What does the insulation do? Could be thermal, could be acoustic. That's the point I wanted to raise ultimately is like why it's there. Depends if it's a ground floor or not. If it's a ground floor, it could be thermal. If it's an intermediate floor, it's not thermal, it'll definitely be um, acoustic, but it stops transmission down through the slab um, to, to the space below. Um, and interestingly, on the left image, if you took the insulation out and you had your, your screed bonded onto your slab, you, you treat it all as one mass and it might be okay that one on the left. You know, you can have slab running continuously underneath, you know, if, if the screen is bonded to it. Yeah. Obviously you might have more transmission down below. So, you know, it's easy to consider all very, very possible. And yeah, back to this one. So I think this slide is a replica of what we've looked at before. So so with a 50 dB RW partition, you've got, you know, a close to 50% split, uh, and then no matter, you know, uh, as you go down the, the rows, you've got 5 dB increases of the walls, but then overall performance on site is not increasing because you have significant flanking parts. So, you know, like I said, no matter how much you beef up the wall, if your flanking part is not dealt with, then you're not going to get an overall better. So one solution is to put a raised access floor. So this reduces the noise hitting the floor slab because you have to go through the raised access floor. And then on the other side, you have to go back through the raised access floor again. So you're now starting to deal with uh, the flanking through the floor slab. So you can see that by putting that in, even with the, the initial 50 dB RW wall, your, your flanking path contribution is 37%, and that is 
way lower than 54% without the race access floor, right? So just by putting that in, you're de de dealing with it. And now, because your flanking contribution <coughs> is lower, <coughs> the more you increase the, the wall performance, you're actually still you're getting more betterment each time. So between that, although it's small, you're still getting a betterment from 50.4 to 50.7, whereas before, there was basically just no difference. And can anyone guess where I'm going next with the, the next solution? Yes. So yeah, if you put a ceiling in, then you're reducing you know, the sound generated in that left-hand side room. We'll have to go through the ceiling and then through the floor slab and then back out and then back through the ceiling again. So you're trying to put obstacles for the sound to you know, transmit through. So when you're looking at details, you're trying to, you know, and if I'm, you know, if I get sent a drawing from the architect saying, oh, does this detail look okay? Then I'm looking for the weakest path. And then I'm, I'm you know, I'm thinking to myself, oh, is this okay? And if not, how, what can I do to block that sound going through that weakest sound path? So that's kind of the thought process behind it. And, and the numbers will kind of paint the same picture because now we're dealing with both flanking paths. So initially, it's 10% flanking. So, uh, so it's much lower. Uh, but if you can see that, even between 60 and 65 dB walls, you're getting well, uh, you know, good, good uh, improvement there. And similar with between those walls as well. Considering that we've got 69% uh, flanking with both the ceiling and the, the floating floor being put in, what can we do to reduce that 69% even further? Kind of relating back to kind of the previous slides, what can we do to improve the, the flanking mitigation? Decoupling. Yeah, decoupling. So what would that look like? Like the decoupling will be between like the ceiling and the floor slab or yeah. the floor floor. Exactly. So you can, it will be difficult to do it, like decouple it completely unless you build. So, so the coupling is through this, right? So you're hanging the ceiling. So you're coupling through that. But let's say if you got rid of that hanging and then you, uh, let's say, fix the ceiling here, so there's no cup, like it's not coupling onto the floor slab, then that will get you. Uh, an improvement. I mean, decoupling there might be a little bit difficult to completely separate it because with all the loads, you know, it's still being put onto the floor, and I'm not sure if, if you could probably tie it there uh, because you have such a long distance between the two walls that you're planning into, so you probably like bulk. Um, so it's probably not really a practical solution. Yeah, but, but, but the best solution would be if you had two floor traps that didn't continue across the wall on the yeah. wall. It's completely split as well, completely decoupling both rooms from each other. Yeah. But then it gets to the point where you've just got two buildings <laughs> next to each other. So, yeah, the biggest problem with that, as you touched on mentioning practicality, is it's just expensive. If you're splitting the slab, you've got to then support the your structure, and you're never going to convince a contractor to go down that route unless you're looking at some seriously high levels of sound efficiency with both the specific looking at a commercial lab or a new big studio or something like that. Yeah. And then the next best thing to decoupling is adding resilient, like resilient layer. So what we mean by resilient layer is something that, uh, that dampens the, the vibration through. So you're basically trying to change the impedance of different materials. So you need, so the sound has to go through a different impedance change uh, to get to the other side. So that would mean for this one, you know, you could put in uh, like a dampening material there, let's say a layer of rubber. Uh, and that might help. 
And for there, you might have sort of hanging is the, the coupling bit, right? So if you're trying to put something dampening, then you might have a section of that hanging that's not rigid. You're trying to reduce rigidity here. So you're trying to think about trying to think about mechanisms that reduce rigidity or materials that reduce rigidity. So those are the kind of main options. Uh, so resilient materials. So in terms of airborne noise, so if that, that's uh, a floating floor or race access floor. Um, so you can put rubber strips here. Uh, so that would mean you know, the noise generated in the room, uh, hitting that floorboard will st struggle to get through, well, compared to before, because you have the damper there, the rubber strip. And also you can put that bottom as well. And that's uh, another way. Uh, you've got this for impact noise. You can put a resonant layer there. So this is an example of this would be, let's say, a uh, uh, liner or vinyl uh, flooring. And then you have a, a layer of rubber or something. Yeah. Is it effective? Is it really effective? It is effective. Yeah, it's, it's good. Um, like, like, I know there's something they call the mute pad or something. I don't know the product, but I can guess what it might be. Yeah. yeah. How, much, how many millimeters, though, do you need to? Uh, really depends on the product. Uh, you can get anything from, you know, a uh, couple of mil to 10 mil. And depending on, like, different products use different materials, so it's not exactly tied to the exact thickness. But usually, the thicker it is, the more resilient the resiliency you get. Uh, and that might be rubber or other, you know, other mechanisms. Um, but yeah, it is effective. Uh, you can get anything up to, let's say, 25 dB improvement. Which is pretty good. So you know, um, so impact through a concrete floor is not good because concrete floor is like so rigid that if you do that, then the vibration will just go straight straight through, right? Uh, that's why usually if you have a concrete floor, you need a resilient layer like that on top, so you don't reduce the the footfall noise. Yeah. Yeah. But for timber floor, like timber floor. Timber floor. Well, timber floor is not amazing at uh, impact reduction either. And again, you'll be looking at uh, some, some kind of resilient layer, uh, either as you know underneath the floor finish, or you can have it as part of the floor construction as well. Um, what you can do is, so if you have, let's say, a timber floor, like floorboard, timber joists, and the room below will have like, let's say a plausible ceiling, right? So plausible ceiling is usually just screwed into the the joist yeah. or, or some, some kind of hanging mechanism, but you can add resilient layer there. So you can have like a, this thing called resilient hanger and you can screw in, but it's, it's this thing where it has kind of a bit of a bounciness um, just to do with the shape of it. Uh, so if, so the, the noise traveling through will, will be reduced by the bounciness of that mechanism. So you can do things like that. So you can have resilient materials like a rubber, or have a resilient hanger. So those would be a kind of a... What about rock wool and stuff? Rock wool, well, rock wool is not really used for like structural reasons. So it's not, it's not like, so if you think about like the most rigid path through a floor, it's not going through rock wool. So adding rock wool in the cavity might not be that as effective as other ones? It, you should, it depends what you're doing with the yeah. I mean, that, that left part of the image, obviously, you can see that on the joists, you've got those resilient layers. So I think what the, the big rectangle on top of the ceiling, I think that is representing a rock wall type insulation. So I, I, it's also it's about dealing with your direct, I guess it's a bit different, but it's dealing with all of your transmission paths. So obviously, uh, as Carl's saying, is like if, if you put rock wall in, but you've still got your studs, it's not going to make much difference. But if you've dealt with the direct transmission of your studs, then the rock wall will help any yeah. go through it, basically. But you wouldn't really have rock wall, but not as part of the concrete floor, but you could have it below it, and it, and it definitely can help. But I, I think concrete and timber floors are just bad in slightly different ways. I think timber floor is definitely worse. Obviously, you, you probably all three or four pounds people will agree with this for a bit. You know, you do have a lot of impact issues. Concrete floor, once you get energy into it, it goes everywhere. But because it's heavier, it's harder to excite it and get get that into it. But if if you use a tapper on a concrete floor, it, it, it just sounds like it's going everywhere in the building. You know, it's, but it's almost a full effort testing approach as opposed to um, 
you know, anything else. And you, when, when we test it, you're not allowed to test on a carpet if it's in a residential dwelling because the that's what's been quite flat, like a hard tile floor, and, and, and it doesn't work. So quite often you have to have a really new layer of plastic to floor. So. Yeah, and I think this relates back to what Max was saying earlier about the sound overall sound installation is only as good as the weakest part. So you want to identify if it's the flanking or the direct path or which flanking path that's the weakest and then try to deal with those specific weakest paths. And that re kind of relates back to this. So, I mean, let's say you're, you know, you're on that one. So around 50-50, so no matter which one you improve, you, st you should see an improvement. Of that one, if your contribution through the direct is 8%, then if you improve that, you're not going to get much betterment, but you've got 92% flanking. So clearly your attention should be at the flanking. Have you guys done any tests with other missions? No. used to be on this problem. That, help, that helps a lot. Um, but effectively, decibels are a lot of this, you know, um, the 50 plus, well, acoustics, I used to do a joke, with two, acoustics, we only stand where two plus two equals five. You know, because uh, every time you add two equal numbers together, you get a plus two increase. But if you have a difference of 10 or more, you ignore the smaller number. So 50 plus 40 is still 50. And that's effectively what's happening here behind the scenes. Obviously, your flanking limit is, is, it doesn't matter how much you reduce your other one by, you're still limited by that flanking limit. It was controlled here. It's only how you cover that. Uh, yeah. Okay, next one. Resilient, uh, another different resilient materials. So for a wall, so we've got these two examples here. On the left-hand side, we've got the standard wall type. So this relates back to the kind of wall construction uh, where Max touched on before, where we've got one layer of brick, one layer of concrete block, and you have to tie them together so they don't fall, uh, and then they kind of support each other. Uh, so you so basically you put a tie, and then you put more mortar, <coughs> and then you keep building the blocks and the bricks, and then you put more ties in. So every, let's say, 600 millimeters, you put a tie in. So that's kind of how you keep it together. But the tie, why is the tie annoying for us in terms of flanking? Exactly. So when you excite, when you uh, generate noise in one room uh, and then you excite the, the brick and then the vibration will travel through the rigid connection and then excite the block and then you've got the noise on the other side. Um, but we don't like the rigid path. So we can have this which is a wall, acoustic wall tie. And what this bit is, is that, so that is like one piece, and that is another piece. And in between it, you've got resilient material. So when you excite this side, the, uh, the vibration is traveling through here, and it wants to go onto that one, but because of the, that resilient material there, it's, it's making it more difficult to go through. So you can have different, so you're kind of using mechanisms as well as materials. You can't, you know, just have, you know, uh, just a middle bit of the tie just being rubber because that won't hold it together. So you need to have kind of both. You need to use mechanisms as well. I've never thought about it before, but looking at that image on the left, you're probably thinking how much sound to get transferred through one little tiny <laughs> strand of metal. Uh, not the best image, I guess, but the key is, is that these wall, pads, wall ties are almost on every block. So you have them peppered all over a wall. They have to be quite a lot. Equally structurally, it's not going to do a lot. It's just one as well. So they're, they're just everywhere. So it is more extreme than it looks on the left. Yeah. I got the resilient uh, hangers. So this is what we talked about earlier. So we've got the standard hangers look like that. So just a steel rope, basically, steel cable. And this is an acoustic ceiling hanger. Uh, and you can see that. So it still supports the weight of all the, the whole ceiling grid and all the tiles. Uh, but the resilience is just that bit, I think. <clears throat> and that, that bit. Kind of provides like a kind of cushioning, bouncy, uh, non-rigid connection. You probably know it's a bit of a trend with rubber. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rubber's, <laughs> Rubber's a friend. Um, so raised access floor. So that's kind of a standard um, construction of it. So you have the, the pedestal, and that's all like you know rigid, like steel legs, and then and then you got the the big tiles that you put on. Well, on this one, you have I a mean, slightly different uh, method there. So you've got the joist, and what these little legs do is they're kind of, again, bouncy, rubbery thing. Um, so when you jump on it, you still have the, the cushiony um, 
non-rigid connection, so you're not exciting the, the floor underneath as much. So that's both good for impact and sound insulation, as in airborne sound insulation. Uh, so that, that's a good one. Now we've got, we've got uh, sound and masonry wall, masonry uh, wall absorber sort. So basically, if you build, let's say, a twin, uh, like, like a cavity wall, so you've got block work, block work, and a cavity in between, and you've got you know, a room, room. Uh, and then if that is built on a concrete slab, then what happens is that when you generate noise in this room and you excite this first layer of block, the, the excitement, so the vibration actually carries through the floor because it's connected through the concrete floor and then back through the, uh, well, you can go through the floor or you can go back onto the, the second leaf of the, of the wall. Uh, so what this bit is trying to do is trying to cut the connection between the bottom of the, the block work wall by, so it's these things uh, there, like again, rubbery, cushiony, springy thing, uh, trying to cut off the rigid connection. I think you get the idea, yeah. Uh, and the extreme case of this is box in the box. I think we have a slight, kind of an example in, uh, was it one in, you know, we got the, the two A and the C, yeah. yeah. So what, I think they're box in a box type things because you got yeah yeah that's it because it's uh, yeah because those are raised so you're trying to cut off the connection to the to the actual floor and then the ceiling's lowered so you're trying to cut cut off the connection to the top so that's yeah good for sound insulation uh, and then that you, know, you can see how all the different mechanisms that cut off the rigid connection. Is being used on all, all four sides, uh, and you want to do, you know, do that all over, so you have a nice, isolated box in a box, and that's the, that's the idea behind it. So this one, so this is uh, taken out of um, building regulations guidance, um, and we might get sent pictures like this from the architect saying, "Oh, is this okay?" and then. We will have to like kind of look at it, assess it, trying to think about the weaker sound bar. I mean, this is a guidance uh, drawing, so this is meant to be good. <clears throat> so, do, do you guys know what we're looking at here? So, so what is what is that bit? So that's the wall. So th this is like an aerial view. So we've got that's a separating wall. And then that is that looks like a, uh, like a facade wall, so like external wall. You know, if we build the wall in that facade, then that's kind of what we're looking at from kind of an aerial view. Uh, so we've got so we've got double double layers of plasterboard here on either side. You can see that we've got individual studs, C studs. So we can tell that this is a nice beefy wall. So the fact that we're separating these two layers with individual studs, that's decoupling. We're trying to like, so instead of using one big stud, we're trying to separate it and decouple it. Uh, so we know that the wall is good. And uh, now we want to kind of assess the flanking side. So we're going, you know, what I'm thinking of is, you know, if, it's, if it's okay there, then what happens here? So the sound will come through here. It's just one layer of plasterboard. And you've got mineral in the cavity, which is good. Um, and then what we can see here is more plasterboard. So, so sound will have to come through here. One plasterboard, cavity, mineral wall, another plasterboard, cavity, mineral wall, another plasterboard, another plasterboard. So we've got like four plasterboards like separated to go through. So that's pretty good. Uh, and as long as we don't have what we talked about earlier about uh, the same cavity resonance, so we want to kind of have it mismatched, uh, then that's good. Um, so if we took out these two plasterboards, then we have just one layer, the sound will travel right through, and another layer, and that might not be particularly good compared to the, the nice beefy wall. So we might have like high percentage of blanking sound, <clears throat> blood, sound energy and low percentage from, from the wall. So that's why they've introduced these two plasterboard bits to uh, mitigate that. And now the blanking contribution is should be lower. So that's the idea behind it.
Do another one. So this one is looking at a section view. So now we're not not an area view, but we're cutting through kind of that way. Uh, so we've got the floor, we've got the raised, uh, the floating floor as well, we've got the, the nice DV wall. So I think it's kind of the same wall there, because we've got two layers of glass wall on either side. We've got, I'm assuming that is one um, one stud there, another stud there. Um, and then we've got the floor. So what's good about this is that we've got a nice beefy wall. So we're not particularly worried about sound going through that wall. Uh, and then we've got uh, the noise going through the, the floorboards. And then you can see about this thing. That's probably some kind of a resilient thing. So that's, that's good. So we've got that, and then it goes through the concrete floor, and then got another resilient thing there, and it has to go through that. So basically, you have going through multiple materials. And every time you go through an air cavity, the sound is having to go through an impedance change. So that's where it kind of loses efficiency and energy. So that's usually good. As long as you treat the resonance within the cavity, cavities are like good. They are like the, the useful tools to improve sound insulation. So that's another one. Uh, so yeah, in real buildings, I mean, what we usually find is, is, is that people don't really, well, they don't understand acoustics because they can't see it. <coughs> and I've you know I've just gone to a, an office building the other day where they've so anywhere that you can't see from the room, they will like the construction quality is really poor because they're like, ah, oh, no one's going to look at it, and this, that's where the flanking path is usually. Because no one really paid attention to it, they didn't, they didn't finish the wall properly, they didn't seal gaps, and that's where you get like problems uh, often. It's quite funny, but one thing we have told uh, site managers to do on site is tell uh, tell the people doing the work they just buy a stocking beam for nothing, expect it a lot more, and tell them it's just an acoustic beam site. Yeah, Why yeah. Any details get built properly. Yeah. But funny that's not fire and acoustics can work together a lot on a lot of details. We see it in our buildings quite well, so we like that to work together and make sure it gets done properly. Yeah. Especially after the Grenfell Tower thing, yeah, everyone, you know, understandably care care about fire a lot more. Um, so yeah. And uh, now we kind of look through just examples of something that's not designed very well. So, uh, so this is like a wall, in, probably like an internal wall, uh, going up to uh, the roof, and you've got that so the, you can tell that this is a steel frame structure because you've got all the steel columns and you've got all the steel supports and then you know the roof is resting on that uh, and then the, and then I'm assuming that this block work wall with a layer of plasterboard put on on the side that's not like load bear, bearing because you've got the got this you know, load bearing steel uh, structure but what's happening here is that because they built the wall in line with the, the steel column and all that kind of complicated junction, you've got loads of gap between the two areas, right? So on the other side, if you make, you know, generate noise here, then all the sound will be escaping through here. And like we said earlier, like the overall sound installation is only as good as the weaker sound part. So basically you need to treat that to have a decent uh, performance at the end. So, you know, if, if I saw that on site, then I'm like, mm, no, not, not good. I think it's like, it's a point, it's, fun, it's, fun, it's fully avoidable if you could fit a better design coordination as well. You know, that, that steel support, I'm sure it could have been the yeah. fiber rail up and it wouldn't have been interrupting the separate wall. Yeah, exactly. Uh, got another one here. So this is, so this is a good example. So of a penetration detail. So, so that is like a cable tray. I'm not sure if I can find one in this room. It's probably not in here. Maybe it's up above the. It's probably above the ceiling tiles. We have like a cable tray here, and then you have you know the green cables running through. Um, and then if you wanted the cables to go through this wall, then you'd be making a hole and put, putting the cables through. But you need to seal it properly to you know make sure that the sound installation performance of this wall is not compromised. So what we can do here is put the cable through uh, and then close the gap as much as possible using the kind of plasterboard kind of collars, is what we call it, um, and just overboarding the 
possible, just to close the gap as much as possible. And then we can put something dense in there, like this, these are sandbags. Um, but you, you know, or something similar, something dense we can put in. I think a lot of the time that you know, uh, construction workers, they think they, you just shove mineral wool in there and it's all like nice and, nice and uh, sealed, but it's actually not all that good. So mineral wool is good for like room acoustics and res like uh, reducing uh, resonances in cavities but not as like pure sound insulation material. You know, you can you can talk through like mineral wool fly, so you can't expect it to block sound like entirely. So that's why you need something dense like sandbags. And then we want to kind of finish off the very very small gaps using like mastic. So these blue dots are like mastic, so you want to just make sure it's kind of completely sealed off. So that, that's a bad example of uh, the cable tray, uh, or cable run penetration. So what they've done here, the, the first thing that's not good is that they actually put the cable tray straight through and you can't see it properly because the cable tray is in the way and there's a, like, you know, there's, I mean, it looks like there's a, a couple of cables there, one cable through this one, and then we can't even see that properly because of the cable tray. So what they should have done is cut the cable tray here before they penetrate it and then just have a very small hole where the cable goes through on its own and then you can you know, seal off the the, the hole uh, individually so that's much better uh, so yeah cable tray should have stopped there another thing is that they've penetrated the wall where there's like a 90 degree angle so they've got this bulkhead where they've gone through and and if they you know uh, made a hole in the wall, like in, a little bit higher or a little bit lower, and you just would have had the you know, flat surface with a hole, and you can just seal that. You know, it's, it's way easier. So the, you, know, you need to think about things like this uh, in our jobs. And we get we get cold on site, um, and uh, for like a site inspection, and if we saw that, then we'd be like noting it down, uh, and then letting the contractor know that this is not gonna result in a particularly good acoustic sound insulation. So we'll have to do some work on that. So this one, so what, what might be the problem with this one? Any guesses? What's the size hole? Yeah, the holes are quite big. I mean, they probably didn't need to cut the hole as big. Uh, what about the cable tray? Yeah, exactly. Knock it off. Like they, they, they're putting the, cable, the entire cable tray through, which is not good. And the third thing is just the congestion. If you have so many things going through the wall, like in, in a congested area, then it's hard to see it properly. So they should have kind of, um, kind of spaced it out. Uh, and then, yeah. It's uh, one thing to look at a, a drawing or a model of how the should all definitely look at, but you've got to think some some poor bugger on site's got to get his hand around there and actually physically do this. And you know, there's no way they're going to ever do that properly. You just can't get into the areas where you need to, to see this. So, yeah. thinking about workmanship and vulnerability, and that's where I think we, we're quite popular with a lot of contractors and going to see these real problems, and you know, it just helps to build that experience, understanding of what is actually happening on site and how do we you know, mitigate these risks in the design stage to uh, the execution and look like this. I mean, if we, you know, if this was a finished thing, then I'd be very worried because those holes are not sealed at all. I mean, if you had, if we went and tested it, which is what we're going to do in the practical, then you'd hear all the noise coming through that hole. So, yeah, it's it's not good. Uh, and then what we've got here. So we've got. Uh, so this is a resilient bar that we talked about. So the idea is that. The sound generated in this room will excite this plasterboard, and then it will try to go through this way. But because of this bit, so this bit's kind of like crinkly and bouncy, and because of that, the noise, uh, the vibration doesn't go through as well. So that's the idea of it. But the whole point is that you're trying to uh, not fully decouple, but put a, add resilience from here. So you're trying to you know, separate these two elements. But what's happening there is that, so there, so it might not be clear, but this is meant to be two plasterboards. You put one plasterboard, you screw it in. You put another plasterboard, you screw it in. 
uh, but what happened there is that when they put the first plaster board in and screwed it in, they used a screw that's too long, so they actually like included a, a rigid connection just like so they bypassed this hanger, the resilience of this hanger, and they just rigidly connected the plaster board. So that that's why they the big red cross on there, and that's what's happened there. So they put, built that um, plaster board on, and they screwed it in, but the screw went in too far, so they just rigidly connected it, and they probably put another screw in to, to connect these two. But yeah, so they've just done it wrong. They just bypassed the entire uh, idea of. A lot of these board manufacturers now, what they do is they issue their screws and very clearly identify all different colored boxes. And basically only give out the first box and short screws when they're put on the first layer. So basically to reduce the chance of that happening. It's so easy to happen. Mm. And you've done it on my kitchen counter at home drilling up and oh, that screw is too long to come out the top. You know, it, it's so easy to happen. You've just got to make sure that the long screws are not accessible when they could cause a problem. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is a drawing that we got sent from uh, an architect saying, oh, this is what we're planning to build, but is this okay? Um, so what we're looking at is a wall, uh, so that's a single stud, because that's a stud there, and then you've got a plasterboard, plasterboard, and that is, uh, it's probably plasterboard again, oh, it's MDF. Um, and then we've got, so this is the profile metal deck. So this is what we saw earlier in that picture where those guys were pouring concrete onto that like crinkly tin thing to make the in-situ concrete floor. Uh, so that's the same same material there. And the idea is that you know you want to generate noise in here and not be able to hear it there. Um, so so when we get sent details, uh, obviously the, the direct sound path is important, but we assume that we've already covered it because that's kind of the easier thing to sort out. In terms of design. So now we're thinking, oh, flanking parts, is it all going to be okay? So, so, <coughs> so assuming that the direct path is okay, we've got sound going in here. Um, so, in, in this case, we've got go through this material and then that material into the void with the insulation and, and out through that, and then that material and the material. So, if that part is okay. Uh, this side, uh, we've got so it says for mineral wool, so that has mineral wool in it, and that has uh, acoustic infill <coughs> as well, acoustic infill above. So <coughs> you have to go through that. Uh, cavity mineral wool through this again, this again, that again. So again, I think that looks sufficient to me. Uh, but what they built on the site is this. So we still got the crinkly tin thing. Uh, and you've got the wall being built up. What's the difference between this picture and the last drawing? So that's the last drawing. I got this. What's the difference? Think about the orientation of something. You've got the wall in the middle, and you've got the profile. The, of the, um, oh, like the shape of it. Like the rotation. Yeah. So I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So so this one, you can see that the wall is going that way, while this one, the wall is going that way. So so this detail only works because the wall is this way and the crinkly pin is also going in the same direction. Well, this one is going like it's perpendicular now, so, um, so it's just a completely different thing. And then they built it assuming that, oh, it's okay because of the last drawing. But what happened here is that you can see this the side bit of the, the profiled metal deck. So that those black bits, so that's like perforation, so they, there's loads of little holes on it. And what, and then if you look at this one, then you can see that in the in this bit, they've got the mineral wool. So acoustic infill above, so that's like mineral wool. <coughs> so if you have um, like perforation, so little holes here, and well there and there, then what happens is that it's, well, what do you think it does? 
if you have perforation and mineral ore there. Um, go away from transmission. So there's three main bits of acoustics: internal noise level, sound insulation, and it will slightly increase transmission. Although yeah. But the main purpose is the third one. It's the room acoustics. So it's an absorption. It's an absorber. So uh, so the reason why we have this is that it absorbs noise, so it reduces um, reverberation time in the room. So that means that we don't, you know, so we're dealing with a room acoustics, not with a ceiling grid, but with this. Um, because they were already going to put this uh, structure in, so they might as well just put perforation in and absorb it that way, and they don't need to put in the, the length and ceiling. But, but what that's actually worked against the design is that sound generated in this room, and let's say there's a room on the other side, then you generate the noise in this room, go into that void with the mineral wall because there's loads of holes on it, and then just go through and then come back out the other side through the holes because that, that thing is continuous. So because they you know they provided provided this drawing and we said it's okay, but they built it wrong. So so we got a really significant flanking path there. So that's another way you can you can go wrong. So interpretation of drawings. And yeah. Uh, so this is touching on what, what I've just said there. So you have the mirror wall in the in the troughs and then you have the perforation. If the troughs were fully filled, it might have been all right, but because they only had a token amount of troughs on to provide the absorption of sound going in there. Yeah. You've got massive open channels between the rooms. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so ideally you want you want it to be full full fill instead of the, just a little bit of insulation. Uh, so what we advise so in that so that, that's a real life example this one and we went on site and then we probably measured thirty something. Yeah, it should have got forty five as a level difference. It got thirty five and ten dB difference in <clears> decibels is a doubling. So it's it was horrendous. Yeah. So we obviously had to give them guidance on what they can do as a as a remedial strategy, and this is what they, what we said they could do. So so that is the wall uh, that we just saw in that picture. And so this is plasterboard, uh, and then that so this layer is that kind of uh, the troughs in the profile metal deck. So we're saying that add let's say a meter either side of the wall. Uh, put an underboard and then cap it. So what? And then so this will be, you know, um, so this would come out a meter from here, and then it'll be throughout the side of the wall, either side of the wall. And and that would that what that means is um, while so while the noise can actually still get through the perforation here, it would have to travel a longer distance with lots of mineral wool. So while it's traveling here, it's getting more and more. Uh, and then it has, has to get, get out here. So instead of just you know, that, the sound path, we're saying it has to do this whole sound path to you know, uh, get through. So we're making it, making it harder for the sound transmission or the flanking to happen. So I think this solved the issue in the end. So we got 10 dB improvement because, because it wasn't working and we identified that it was the flanking that was the issue. So rather than concentrating on the wall itself, we're saying, Oh no, it's a flanking that we need to deal with, and we and we did that, so it worked. A lot more expensive than just getting it right the first time. Yeah. That's, that's always the way. Uh, and this is kind of what we talked about already. Uh, and that's that's basically it. So yeah, so that was kind of intro in flanking, and what kind of thought process we have when we're trying to deal with issues. And... Ideally, we want to deal with all the issues at design stage. So when they're building it, it's all perfect. But often, it's they get certain things wrong, or they interpret our guidance <coughs> like not correctly. Uh, so we have to go on site to just make sure that it's a, it's all okay. Yeah. Um, are you guys all coming to the practical later? Yeah. Great. So in that, we'll um, we'll do some measurements uh, of using the tapper and also airborne sound insulation, and we'll start looking at 
um, flanking as well. We'll try to identify where the flanking is coming from and, you know, kind of explore different ways of solving it. And, and also, you know, so one side is solving flanking issues post-construction, but we might also think about, well, what could, could, I, could they have done the design stage so this didn't happen at all? And things like that, you can start to explore. Do you guys have any questions about any of that or anything unrelated? Um, how much of the work is like that you get at that design stage and how much of it is administrative? Um, majority is design stage. Um, I think we probably like 10% 10, 10 like post construction. Probably less. Design? Than yeah. Um, normally, if it's a job where designing we sort it. At the same time, yeah. you like to think it's mostly designed out. Obviously, that doesn't always happen. We just get tested as well, and that's these examples show. But then we do have standalone appointments where we'll, we'll go into a building next to an airspace, we've got nothing to capture anyway, and then we're looking at a uh, remedial measure in an existing building. And it's always uh, much more of a challenge to fix something before you go than it is to just design it right, of course. So, you know, the best jobs that we'll work on, people won't even notice that they're actually needed, but it will just all of a sudden the architect will. Design to all the right walls and the right junction details, and it all gets built well on site. And if it can get the people involved in the project, um, but next week I'll take all the big UK projects and put works up some some recognition of things and things like that. So yeah, we'll get we always get mixed up with it goes down to the architect, even the landscape architect sometimes is not as far as us. It's interesting though because we get to learn about like how buildings are constructed and how it should be constructed. Um, and we, you know, we go on site and we see <clears throat> things like, you know, firsthand and it's really interesting. And we work on a range of different projects we have. So I mainly deal with schools, but I can do, you know, I might do offices or leisure centers or police stations or all sorts. Uh, and then others in the office might do uh, residential. Um, and we're all, always like putting quotes in for just random stuff like we got one for for a stadium uh it's interesting um and then we, we do you know bits and pieces in bristol as well so it's nice to just walk past the building and think oh yeah i did that one <laughs> uh, that's quite like a nice thing uh anyone got questions about just the job in general or the industry if you're thinking about Are you you know, this. uh we're always half recruiting yeah. so so yeah if you're if you fancy it then I remember the exact us. same, like, you know, you had an open position. I think like they sent CV or something. All right. But when was that one? A few months ago. Right. Did, uh, did you send it by email to yeah. one? Right. Maybe you just never got picked up. I, 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 what, what's your name, sorry? Ron. Ron. Doesn't mean you got I mean, like, you also posted on the, like, the UE group on Facebook. Possibly. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, as Kyle said, we're always half. Recruiting, you know, we we we're not sure who we're looking for yet. You know, I think that's that's part of it. But um, but no, I, I mean, we have a chat about that in practical as well. I can make sure that I get people that we need to get back to at the very least. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys all third years, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you got ideas about what you want to do after? Somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> what, what what are you thinking of? <laughs> Music. <laughs> Music. <laughs> Broad, <laughs> yeah. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I did uh, acoustics at placement, and then I came back for third year, and then I did my acoustics module, and then yeah, then joined Mac afterwards. So. Oh, so you did placement in Mac? No, I did placement in a different different company, um, and then yeah. And join Mac afterwards, but you, you don't need to do placement in the Q60. You know, we've got plenty of graduates from UE as well but that hasn't done any uh, Q6 beforehand. Uh, some some have done the Q6 module, some have not. So all mixed bag really. What was the learning curve on the job? Um, it's steep. Yeah, I mean because like the Q6 module, it's it's good, but you know, it's, it's only barely touching the surface of it. So there's, you learn a lot about acoustics as soon as you, you start. And uh, I, I mean, I'm still learning tons every day, so. Yeah, we're always learning, I'm still learning. Yeah. yeah. I think the acoustics is the easy bit, though. 
because you're surrounded by Prefecto on that. It, it's how it interacts with the, the ventilation design, the daylighting, and the impact you have on other parts of the building is where it gets more challenging. Like, you know, if you say, oh, we're going to put in a floor away from a kilogram per meter squared surface mass, we can tell these people, you know, structural engineer just faints because there's no way you're straight to support that. And okay, that's not a sensible solution. And you start to understand what you can and can't do is the, is the real art of it. And that just mm, yeah. comes from experience, really. Um, but yeah, no, when I, when I started at Mac, um, I, I went straight for uni and started straight at Mac. But someone I was on the course with at the time needed a placement in the, in this, in the third year. So then he went back to uni when I started at Mac. Um, so it works both ways, you know. I think we do take on a number of um, places of students. Um, most recently, we've been taking some from um, Southampton University, you know, Institute of Sound and Vibration Research over there. Um, but we have had plenty of students over from past. We've got like a few guys now. Appreciate that. But we did occasionally teach some in second year as well. Um, when well, I say quite cool students, so do you like in the daily world, like do you come across a lot? Is it some kind of method? Not at all. Obviously, yeah. we, it's all about regulations and standards. That what does the building need to achieve, and what people think about is a uh, feel about that. I mean, it's, it's very interesting, but yeah, it's not what they are doing. Yeah. So. Do you ever push and challenge the standards? Sorry. Do you ever push and challenge the standards? Absolutely. I mean, uh, being out of three in music spaces, which interestingly we'll talk a little bit later on to see how people use all these. Are you know they're they're not good enough for the music standards, and you know we. Quite often in the past, we've talked about many scenarios where we design a school that meets the standards plus a little bit, and the music department are not happy with it. You know, and you go back and test it, yeah, it is all compliant, unfortunately. So, that's something we certainly make a lot of building trackers aware of. So, look, if you're <coughs> this, they're not going to be happy with it. Here's what we recommend, and you know, a lot of best trackers certainly do look for that kind of thing. Like, they want to produce good buildings, and they find themselves out of pocket going to repair things that aren't broken, but it's just because the standards aren't good enough. So, absolutely, I mean, it's just a starting point. It is your minimum standard. Money is everything. Money is king on everything, unfortunately. So, yeah, it's uh, a lot of our school projects are funded by the Department for Education, who they're always underfunded, as I'm sure you know, yeah. Kyle, Kyle Billy, so I'm sure those projects are uh, at Mac. And you've already got a strict budget, and you know, particularly with Grenfell, Fire is now much more up, up for priority of people's and the structures, obviously. Absolutely clear, if a building falls down, people die, you know, if the acoustics is wrong, people will get annoyed, you know, it's very different scale. So we are bottom of the list. We, it's easy to shrink our budget, so quite often we're working to the smallest fee to just get to the standards. And it's frustrating, it's, it's yeah, it may, but it, it varies kind of client, you know, not everybody's looking for cheapest, just just quite building. Sometimes, you know, you are designing um, something a bit more more special. I think working, working for church clients is quite. Um, interesting because there's nothing mandatory it's all about just working on the client side helping them understand what they want so they can make the decisions that we give them support so yeah we, we have a real real good range of things and, yeah but because <coughs> space drafters we're very grounded in reality of okay what what is actually feasible what can be built and as opposed to specifying a hundred dB target that can never actually be met or that sort of thing yeah. which we didn't come across what a million or hundred dB so, um, that's the question. Yeah. Um, I mean, Mac has done uh, is now Bristol Beacon. What? Is, it, is that what it's called now? But that is, isn't it? Yeah. Colston, Colston Hall. But we don't say it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we did a bit of that one. Yeah, there's a you know, Tilton College. Um, there's a new building sort of on what the fact that I can't park. It's a yeah. nice CO2 structure. Yeah, I think it's called SGS, isn't it? SGS. Yeah. Um, yeah, I went and tested, um, not when I, when I was at Mac, but I went and tested um, the bank that was turned into a hotel right next to um, St. Nick's Market. You know, that corner, the really posh, you know that one with a big hall? Um, you know the the gates to the the kind of indoor Saint Nick's Market bit, yeah. right in front of it. You know where the oh, weddings okay, often yeah. happen. I went and yeah, that was cool. That had like a big like bank vault, and the inside is like a proper maze. Uh, it's an interesting building. Yeah, the Kensington Town Hall, um, also Royal Scott Town Academy. The school just on the new Royal Scott Estate. 
and that was when the world collapses. Everything kind of stopped. Um, yeah, slowly comes to me all these things. Yeah. Going place to place. I, funny enough, I do a lot of my work in the north, right? Um, I'm actually, I actually live in North Wales, and so I can do like a month or so. Yeah, so I do a lot of work in the Middle East and travel a lot. Yeah, you travel a lot where you're in the south. Uh, well, I only come down to teach you guys in there, yeah. Bit, but yeah, um, yeah, I just, it just organically grew that way. I've got a big house in Nottingham, Manchester, to North Wales. Yeah, I mean, most of yeah. our work is design work, which is which we don't have to go on site. So I think the only time we go on site is when we initially start the project and we go, you know, scope out for the site, uh, see how noisy it is. Because, you know, when we talked about the in, internal noise levels, we have to make sure that the uh, external walls and the ventilation strategy and the glazing is built in a good manner that the controlling the traffic noise breaking into the building. So we need to know how loud the traffic is and other noise sources in the area is. So we do that scoping, initial scoping out at the beginning of the project, and right at the end, we go test the building. So we we see it right at the beginning and right at the end, but often n not much at the beginning, uh, in the middle. Uh, so we just all design work in the middle. Uh, but the companies got you know different roles uh, within the company, and then some people might be going out all the time because the, we have a, like a testing department, and they do sound insulation testing, we do air testing as well, so air tightness testing uh, to check for like leakages. Um, so they're there kind of out testing all the time. They do surveys as well. I don't go out the office that much uh, because I mainly do design work. Um, but yeah, like really varies. So everyone based in the office. Um, yeah, yeah, everyone's based in the office. Yeah, pretty much. Would you say it's like quite a competitive industry? Um, in what way? Have you got any other companies? Or... Yeah, there are. I think yeah. in the Southwest, definitely. I think that's why <clears> we <throat> recently, we don't. We still have plenty of points in the Southwest, but it is quite saturated with other consultancies. Uh, a lot of one man band type consultancies that can all of them replace us. Uh, well, we, we're fairly flexible with those, right? We've got very good clients, and that's what um, helps us stay afloat. I mean, we have been moving up into the Valley of the Projects we've been working on, so we have got a London office as well. Obviously, we've been doing a lot of sort of the, the big residential schemes there at the moment. And that branch onto our energy side of things where we've kind of done the big similar things that have to do with the growing that we want to do package of work. And, and it, it takes a lot of convincing to get people to do it. It's a different way of working. But Walnut Dixon in London, one of the big contractors there, we've got a really good relationship with it. They really appreciate it. And they absolutely love just blending the acoustics and the, and the ventilation together because ultimately we can solve it all together. So we're looking at the facade, looking at how much you can open the window. Is that enough to control over heating? What about the noise? And we're just looking at it all as one package, and it just allows us to make all the decisions to make it all work in balance. So that's been that's probably our biggest recent success, I think. Yeah. Very much a lot of London growth. I think we got our biggest project ever. I think last month we were hundred fifty million pounds uh, for every year for development. So yeah. Yeah, and then what kind of what sets Mac apart from <clears throat> the other companies is that we got the energy department. You know, we do products, we do testing, we can do a lot of things in house. And we you know we have the experts in all of that in the same room, so there's like just so much information that we can learn off of. You know, uh, although I'm an acoustician, uh, I've got uh, my colleague who's a building physicist behind me. So you know, I'm turning around asking him all about building physics, and and that that actually helps with the acoustics because we get a broader picture of what's happening. And it's like, oh, so this is why all the design is you know this way. Because un unless you understand it, you'll be suggesting something that's just completely naive sometimes. And I still do that because obviously I don't understand everything. Um, but I think just being able to like grow the background knowledge on why the building is constructed in, in such a way is uh, really handy. But other companies, you probably wouldn't be able to do that because it, you either get smaller companies, which is you know just acoustics, or you get like huge multidisciplinary companies with like thousands of employees. And you can talk to other disciplines, <coughs> but I think trying to learn off of other disciplines is difficult. I think it's just more to do with like just coordination. Well, they're, they're very departmentalized. Like, yeah. Separate. I mean, I won't definitely won't mention any names, but I know there's a one big firm that uses us instead of their own acoustics department. <laughs> you know, so, you know, the building services engineers of, of that company use us. They prefer us. They just don't want to slap off the record, you know. But they don't want to get found out we're doing that, of course, because their, their directors won't be very happy. But 
I mean, you're talking about how integrated we are. I mean, it, it goes even more um, low level on that. And it comes up to individual people like our colleague Josh. He, he is literally split between runs and his business. He does both. And to like that to a degree, I'd say about 25% of the industry being solely about the energy side. They certainly don't focus on the energy side of anymore. But we've educated a lot of our staff in the house, so we have just appreciated the things. So it really comes down to individual people as opposed to that department does that, that department does that. And there's a great rivalry or anything like that. So, you know, it really is a well rounded team. And I think it goes back to the same as perpetual love for education, teaching, and understanding and figuring things out. I mean, at any design team that you appear to me today, if you ever end up on Mac, you know, you'll, you'll be talking about drainage and you'll be getting involved. You know, and it's like, this really doesn't help us say, but he's just naturally inquisitive at everything, you know, and it's just, uh, it doesn't, doesn't let it go. Yeah. That's what drives us forward. I just realised it's half 11. I feel yeah. like I've kept you hostage for about like half an hour extra. Um, but yeah, you're free to go yeah. <laughs> whenever you want. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we'll see you guys at one o'clock in one and fifty-two. Is that where we start? Yeah. 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 Fifty-two is still good stuff. We'll Let's see how good the UE buildings are. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. See if I do.